Section 14. The Signaler's Day of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The gun detachment were curled up and dozing on the damp straw of their dugout behind the gun when the mail arrived. The men had had an early turnout that morning, had been busy serving or standing by the gun all day, and had been under a heavy shell fire off and on for a dozen hours past. As a result, they were fairly tired. The strain and excitement of being under fire are even more physically exhausting somehow than hard bodily labor, and might have been hard to rouse. But the magic words, the mail, woke them quicker than a round of gunfire, and they sat up and rubbed the sleep from their eyes and clustered eagerly round the number one, uh, the sergeant in charge of the detachment, who was dishing out the letters. Thereafter, a deep silence fell on the dugout, the recipients of the letters crowding with bent heads round the guttering candle, the disappointed ones watching them with envious eyes. An exclamation of deep disgust from the signaller brought no comment until the last letter was read, but then the limber gunner remembered and remarked on it. "'What was that you was rearing up and snorting over signals?' he asked carefully retrieving a cigarette stump from behind his ear and lighting up. The signaller snorted again. "'Just hark at this,' he said, unfolding his letter again. "'I'll just read this bit, and then I'll tell you the sort of merry dance I've had today. This is from an uncle of mine in London. He grouses a bit about the inconvenience of the dark streets, and then he goes on. Everyone at home is wondering why you fellows don't get a move on and do something. The official dispatches keeps on saying no movement or nothing to report. Or all quiet, till it looks as if you was all asleep. Why don't you get up and go for him? The signaller paused and looked up. Say, he said sarcastically, Everyone at home is wondering and doesn't like this all quiet business. I wish everyone at home, including this uncle of mine, had been up in the trenches to die. Have a lively time, asked the number one. We had some warmish spells back here. They had the range to a dock and plastered us enthusiastic with uh, six and eight inch Johnsons and H.G. E. shrapnel. With three wounded and Lucky to get off so light. Lively time's the right word for my performance, said the signaller. Nothing of the all quiet touch in my little lock today. It started when we was going up at daybreak, me and the other telephonist with the forward officer. You know that open stretch of road that takes you up to the opening of the communication trenches? Well, we're just nicely out in the middle of that when fizz comes a shell and bang just over our heads, and the shrapnel rips down on the road just behind us. Then bang, 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 they come along in a regular string down the road. They couldn't see us, and I suppose they was just shooting on the map in the hopes of catching any reliefs of the infantry on the road. Most of the shells was percussion after the first go, and they was slam-banging down in the road and the fields alongside and flinging dirt and gravel in showers over us. Come on, says the forward officer. This locality is looking unhealthy. And we picked up our feet and ran for it. Why, we wasn't all killed about ten times each, I'll never understand. But we wasn't, and we got to the end of the communication trench and dived into it as thankful as any rabbit that ever reached its burrow with a terrier on his tail. After we got a bit of breath back, we plowed along the trench, it was about ankle-deep in bits, to the infantry headquarters, and the F.O. goes inside. After a bit, he comes out and tells me to come on with him up to the observation post. This was about eight at Gamma, and just getting light enough to see. You know what that observation post of ours is. The F.O. has a fond delusion that the germs can't see you when you leave the support trench and dodge up the wreckage to that hedge to the old house. But I have my own opinions about it. Anyway, I've never been up yet without a most unnatural lot of bullets chipping twigs off the edge and smacking into the ditch. But we got into the house all right, and I unslings my telephone, portable, D, Mark Three and connects up with the battery 
while the F.O. crawls up into the top story. He hadn't been there three minutes when smack, smack, I hears two bullets hit the tiles of the walls. The F.O. comes down again in about ten minutes and has a talk to the Major at the battery. He reports fairly quiet except some germ pipsqueak shells dropping out it on our right and a good deal of sniping rifle fire between the trenches in front of us. As a general thing, I've no serious objection to the trenches sniping at each other, if only the germs would aim more careful. But mostly they aim shocking, and anything that comes high for our trench just has the rot elevation for our post. There's a broken window on the ground floor, too, looking out of the room we use a straight at the bushes, and the F.O. wouldn't have me block this up at no price. Concealment, says he, is better than protection. And if they see that winder sandbagged up, it's a straight tip to them this is a post of some sort, and a heavy invitation to them to plunk a shell or two in on us. Maybe he was right. But you can't well conceal a whole house, or even the four walls of one, so I should have voted for the protection myself. Anyhow, he said I could build a barricade at the foot of the stairs, where I'd hear him call his orders down, and I'd be behind some cover. Well, this motion was seconded by a bullet coming in the window and putting a hole in the eye of a life-size enlargement photo of a old lady in a poke bonnet hanging on the wall opposite. The row of the splinter and glass made me think a Jack Johnson had arrived, and I didn't waste time getting to work on my barricade. I got an armchair and the half of a sofa and a broken-legged table and made that the foundation, and up against the outside of them I stacked a lot of table linen and books and loose bricks and bottles and somebody's Sunday clothes and a fender and fire irons and anything else I thought any good to turn a bullet. I finished up by prizing up a hearthstone from the fireplace and propping it up against the back of the armchair and sitting down most luxurious in the chair and lighting up my pipe. That's a long ways the most comfortable chair I've ever sat in. Deep, soft, springy seat and padded arms and covered in red velvet. And I was just thinking what a treat it was when I hears the rifle fire out in front beginning to brisk up. And the forward officer calls down to me to warn the battery to stand by because of some excitement in the trenches. Major says, would you like him to give you them a few rounds, sir? I shouts up. And the F.O. says, yes, three rounds gunfire, on the lines the guns are laid. So off goes your three rounds, and I could hear your shells whooping along over our heads. Number one gun had twenty-five yards, calls down the F.O., and then gives some more corrections and calls for one round battery fire. By this time the rifle fire out in front was pretty thick, and the bullets was hissing and whining past us and cracking on the walls. Another one came through the window and perforated the old lady's poke bonnet, but none of them was coming near me, and I was just about happily concluded I wasn't in the direct line of fire and was well covered from strays. So I was snugging down in my big easy chair with the D Mark III on my knee, puffing my pipe and repeating the F.O.'s orders as pleasant as you please when crack a bullet comes with an almighty smack through the back of the armchair bare inches off me ear. Comfort or no comfort, thinks I, this is where I resign the chair, and I slides out and squats well down on the wet floor. It's surprising, too, the amount of wet an ordinary carpet can hold, and the chap that designed the pattern of this one might have worked in some water lilies and duckweed instead of red roses and pink leaves if he'd known how it would come to be used. This house had been rather a swagger one, judging by the style of the furniture, but one end and a roof having gone west with the shelling, the whole show ain't what it might be. And when the missus, as it belongs to, returns to her happy home, there's going to be some fervent remarks passed about the germs and the war generally. But to get on with the drill, the row in the trenches got hotter and hotter, and our house might have been a high-powered magnet for bullets the way they was coming in, through that open window special. The old lady lost another eye and half an ear, and her Sunday gown had a big uh, gold brooch was shot to ribbage. A bullet cut the cord at last, and the old girl came down bump. 
but I'd been watching her so long I felt she oughtn't to be disgraced lying there on her face before the German fire, so I crawled out and propped her up against the wall, with her face to the window. I hope she'd be glad to know her photo went down with flying poke bonnet. It was shortly after this our wire was first cut about ten Akema. That would be. It, I sings out to the F.O. that I was a disc, but what with the bullets smacking into the walls, the shells passing over us, the coal boxes bursting around, and the trenches belting off at their hardest, the F.O. didn't hear me, and I had to crawl up the stairs to him. Just as I got to the top, a shrap burst, and the bullets came smashing and tearing down through the tiles and rafters. The bullets up there was whistling and whining past and over like the wind in a ship's rigging, and every now and then, whack, one would hit a tile, sending the dust and splinters jumping. The F.O. was crouched up in one corner, where a handful of tiles was still clinging, and he was peeping out through these with his field glasses. Keep down, he says, when he saw me. There's a brace of blanket snipers been trying for a cold half hour to bullseye onto me. There they go again, and crack, smack, two bullets comes, one knocking another loose tile off a foot over his head, and t'other putting a china ornament on the mantelpiece on the casualty list. I reported the wire cut, and the F.O. says he'd come along with me and locate the break. We'll have to hurry, he says, cause it looks to me as if a real fight was breezing up. So we crawled out along the ditch and down the trench following the wire. We found the break. There was three cuts along that bit of road that runs from the rolling river trench down past the bomb store, and I don't ever want a more highly exciting job than we had mending it. The shells was fair raining down the road, and the air was just humming like a harp string with bullets and rickos. We joined up and tacked in and found we was through all right, so we hustled back to the post. That house never was a real health resort, but today it was sort of wicked. They must have suspicioned there was a post there, and they kept on pasting shells at us. How they missed us so often, Evan, and that German gunner only knows. They couldn't get a direct with solid, but I must admit they made goody shooting with shrapnel, and they made the house look like a second-hand pepper caster. The F.O. was having a most unhappy time with shrapnel and rifle bullets, but he had his guns in action, so he just had to stick it out and go on observing, till the wires was cut again. This time the F.O. says to look back as far as the wire ran in the trench, and if I didn't find the break up there, come back and report to him. But I found the break in the edge just outside, and mended it, and went back the bullets still zipping down, and me breaking all the hands and knees records for the fifty yards. I found the F.O. had reined back a bit from his corner and was busy with a bedroom poker, breaking out a loophole through the bricks of the gable-end wall. He came down and told the major about it. It was getting too hot, he said, and the two snipers must have him located with field glasses. One bullet had nearly blinded him with broken tile dust, and another had tore a hole across the side of his British warm, so he was going to try observing through a couple of loopholes. Then he went up and finished his chipping and brought the guns into action again. Just in the middle of a series I feels a most unholy crash, and the old house rocked on its toe and eel. The brick dust and plaster came rattling down, and when the dust cleared a bit and I got my senses and my eyesight back, I could see a splintered hole in the far corner of my ceiling. I made sure the F.O. upstairs was blotted out, cause it was that corner upstairs where his loophole was. But next minute he sings out and asks was I all right. I never felt less all right in my life, but I told him I was still alive far as I knew. I crawled up to see what had happened, and there was him in one corner at his peephole, and the floor blowed the splinters behind him, and a big gap busting the gable wall at the other corner. A shell had made a fair hit just about on his one loophole, while he was looking through the other. I believe we'll have to leave this, he says, and move along to our other post. It's a pity, cause I can't see near as well. If we don't leave this house, sir, I says, seems to me it'll leave us, and in apony numbers at that. So, 
He reports to the major, and I packs up, and we cleared. The shelling had slacked off a bit, though the trenches were still slinging lead hard as ever. We must hurry, says the F.O. They're going to bombard a trench for ten minutes at noon, and I must be in touch by then. We scurried round to the other post, and just got fixed up before the shoot commenced. And in the middle of it, whoop, was first one wire, and then the other. The F.O. said things out loud when I told him. Come along, he finished up. We must mend it at once. The infantry assault a trench at the end of the ten minutes. There they go now. And we heard the roar of the rifle swell up again. He took a long stare out through his glasses, and then we doubled out. The Germans must have thought there was a big assault on, and their gunners were putting a zone of fire behind the trenches to stop supports coming up. And we had to go through that same zone, if you please. Truth, it was odd. There was big shells, or little shells, and middle-sized shells roaring and shrieking up and bursting H.E. shrapnel or smashing into the ground. If there was one threw dirt over us, there was a dozen. One buzzed close past and burst about twenty feet in front of the F.O., and either the windage or the explosion lifted him off his feet and clean rolled him over. I thought he was a goner again, but when I came up to him he was picking himself up and spitting dirt and language out between his teeth, and none the worse except for the shaking. We couldn't find that break. We had to tap in all along the wire to locate it, and all the time it was a race between us finding the break and a shell finding us. At last we got it, where well, we'd run the wire over a broke-up shed. The F.O. was burning to talk to the battery, knowing they'd be anxious about their shoot, so he picked a spot in the lee of a wall and told me to tap in on the wire there. Just as he begun talking to the battery, a coal box soars up and bumps down about twenty yards away and beyond us. The F.O. looks up, but goes on talking. But when another shell, and then another, drops almost on the exact same spot, he lifted the phone closer into the wall and stoops well down to it. I needn't tell you, I was down as close to the ground as I could get without digging. I think we're all right here, says the F.O., when another shell burst right on the same old spot and the splinters went singing over us. They look like keeping on the same spot and we must be out of the line the splinters take. Well, it looked like he was right, for about three more fell without touching us, and I was feeling a shite easier in my mind. There was some infantry coming up on their way to the support trenches, and they filed along by the wall that was covering us. Just as they was passing, another shell dropped. It was on the same spot as all the others, but blow me if it didn't get three of them infantry. They fell squirming right on top of us, and the instrument, so I concluded that spot wasn't as safe as the F.O. had reckoned, and there was a flaw in his argument somewheres that the coal box had found out. The F.O. saw that too, and we shifted out quick time. After that, things quieted down a bit, and the short airs on the back of me neck had time to lie down. They stood on end again once or twice in the afternoon, when we'd some more repairing under fire to do, and then to wind up the day they turned a maxim on, just as we was coming away from the post, and we had to flop on our faces with the bullets zizz, 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 zipping just over us. We took a trench, I hear, and the jocks in front of us had thirty casualties, and the guards on our left had some more, cause I seen them coming back to the ambulance. On the whole, it's been about the most unpleasantest day I've spent for a spell. What we're wading to the knees in the trench mud, getting soaked through with rain, not having a decent meal all day, crawling about in mud and muck, and getting chivied and chased all over the landscape with shells and shrapnel and machine guns and rifles, I've just about had enough of this king and country game. The signaller paused a moment, but his gaze fell on the letter he still held in his hand, and he tapped it with a scornful finger, and burst out again violently, King and country, eh? <laughs> and a bald-headed blighter sitting warm and dry and comfortable by his fireside at home, writes out and tells me what the country's thinking. I come in here after a day that's enough to turn the air of our earth horse gray, and I'm told about my pals being casualtied, 
and to top it all I gets a letter from home, why don't yer do something? Why don't you get up and go for him? Ah. Home, remarked the limber gunner. Um don't know nothing about it. They don't, agreed the signaller. But what I wants to know, and there's many here like me, is why don't somebody let em know about it? Let em really know. End of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable